my first of all, the co-chairman of APPG on third world solidarity, Karen Hargraf, to come and welcome you all. Well, thank you, Mustak. It's a great pleasure to be involved, and I'm delighted to be able to address you this evening. Um, relatively new into politics, my constituency is in glorious North Yorkshire, it's called Thirsk and Malton. But um, the last th three years in politics, it seemed at times, well in politics you're never going to agree with everyone about everything, <laughs> but at times it's felt like you can't agree with anyone about anything, but uh, nevertheless there are some things I think we will all agree on. Number one, um, international trade is very, very important and very, very good for this country, and I believe it's of a great benefit to the countries we internationally trade with. Trade and free markets have revolutionized our planet, our globe. 100 years ago, extreme poverty covered 94% of the population of this planet. Today, only 10% of people live in extreme poverty. 100 years ago, 86% of people on this planet did not get a basic education. Today, 86% of people do get a basic education. And child mortality, the horrendous um, impact of child mortality, affected 43% of us 100 years ago today, uh, and today only 4%. And this, the prosperity, has been delivered primarily through free markets, free trade, and our prosperity and longevity are all byproducts of free markets and international trade. The other thing I think we would all agree on is that for many business person, and I was in business for 25 years before entering uh, Parliament, and I'm still in business today, any business person will tell you the most critical thing they want the government to do is just deliver the infrastructure. Set the path, clear the path, then move out the way and let us get on with it. The business will do the rest. So this, I couldn't be more pleased to be able to address this conference this evening because that's what this is all about. It's putting the infrastructure in place which allows for the trade between international countries. Those huge opportunities, the projects themselves, the financial opportunities, the legal opportunities, the insurance opportunities through the projects themselves, and afterwards, of course, how tra trade will blossom between these nations 68 nations involved in one belt, one road. 68% of the global population. 54 billion pounds of the project in Pakistan alone. And 40% of the total GDP of the planet involved in one belt, one road. So this is huge important in these relationships. And of course, Pakistan itself, how it's moving forward. Moving from a frontier market to an emerging market, so critical. The peace and stability that's happening in Pakistan, which is critical to investment, is moving forward. And the incredibly exciting thing from the UK's perspective, particularly when we move, we're looking further afield for our future markets, we always need to look beyond the European Union. We'll always trade with the European Union, of course, but we need to take advantage of our wider markets, our historic relationships, and where better than some of the fastest growing markets in the world. Both Pakistan and China are growing around 6% a year in terms of GDP growth. So how exciting could it be? UK, UK companies, uh, companies in Pakistan and China, all, and many other countries, all have these huge opportunities. They're the opportunities there. Let's make sure we make the most of it. Thank you very much. When prosperity comes, when democracy established, stability comes, automatically peace follows. Now I'm going to invite Liz Liz, the chairwoman, chairwoman of FPPG on Third World Solidarity, member of Parliament of Leiden, to come and speak to us. Well, thank you very much, Mustak, and thank you to all of you for coming here this evening for this really important event. I was really pleased that when I succeeded Dave Anderson as Member of Parliament for Blaine, I was able to keep up our real links 
between third world solidarity, ABPG, uh, and, come and contribute to your discussions and your events. So I'm really pleased to be here today. And ABPG, for third world solidarity said, uh, of working for peace and economic prosperity. A long history and, and long may that continue. And uh, we know that this is a hugely important topic we're talking about today. As Kevin has said already, Kevin Hollenberg has said, you know, trade is really important, a really important way of developing countries and developing people and bringing prosperity. And uh, I understand that uh, Pakistani officials have predicted that the uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor uh, will uh, result in the creation of upwards of 2.3 million jobs between 2015 to 2030, and add two to 2.5 percent points to the country's annual economic growth. So I'm really glad that you're all here this evening. I'm sure you'll have really productive discussions, and I wish you well in this process. You have some terrific speakers, so without further ado, I'm going to wish you a very successful meeting and uh, move on. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to welcome uh, Zoe Reed, who will travel all the way from Manchester, and she is the chairwoman of SACO, Society of Anglo China Understanding, and they produce a magazine quarterly. So, can I say, raise your hand, and everybody can see you. And she is a founder member of Third World Solidarity. She's a journalist, very senior journalist, and works with us for a very long time, she's going to just briefly uh, speak on Keith Bennett's presentation, which he can't do it. So can we welcome Sandra Sattel? I'm very, very sad indeed that Keith Bennett's mother is ill, and um, it's always not a good thing to read someone else's speech, but I would let, I'm going to endeavor to do justice to what Keith Bennett has said. Basically, Keith Bennett went in November with Mushtaq Lashari and true Mushtaq Lashari on his first trip to Pakistan to look at CPEC um, and other aspects of the Pakistan um, economy um, and political elements. Um, I think that Keith was completely blown over um, so I'm now going to read, I, I condensed somewhat because Keith was keynote speaker and I'm going to try and represent him to some extent with Keith's own words. Thank you for that. Um, as China's economy has advanced and as its poverty levels have inex inex inexorably declined, we find the issue of prosperity for both China's neighbors as well as for the wider world increasingly coming to the fore. China is therefore increasingly taking the lead in the creation of new institutions designed not to supplant existing bodies, but to supplement them. And that's a key, key point. Sorry, I'll just leave it to his words, but I, I'm, I'm really impressed with the research that, that Keith has done on this and what he says. Um, by far the most ambitious initiative that China has unveiled is President Xi Jinping's concept of the Belt and Road Initiative, also known as the New Silk Roads. Spanning the three continents of Asia, Europe, and Africa, and embracing at least 65 countries, <coughs> this revival of ancient trade groups, which first took shape when the Chinese dynasties of the East were complemented by the Roman Empire in the West and the Indus Valley, Persian and other great civilizations along the way, is at the same time strikingly modern in its desire to uphold global free trade and an open world economy and to enhance regional cooperation based on market principles. I think I would like to have written this, I agree wholeheartedly myself. Um, China's initiative to jointly build the Belt and Road, embracing the trend towards a multipolar world, 
economic globalization, cultural diversity, and greater IT application aims at being highly efficient in terms of the allocation of resources and at achieving a deep integration of markets among <coughs> the countries concerned, thereby jointly creating an open, inclusive, and balanced regional economic cooperation architecture, in case words, that benefits all. The initiative is an open one. It covers, but is not limited to, the area of the ancient Silk Road. It's open to all countries and international and regional organizations so that the results will benefit wider parts of the globe as well. In addition to the new Silk Road crossing many continents, there is the six economic corridors, and part of this is Pakistan. China's vision for Pakistan is immense. And I'll go on to refer to some of the um, outcomes of what's happened. Um, basically, China, through Pakistan, entering the Indian Ocean through the port of Gwadar. This is, of course, the famous China-Pakistan economic corridor, as we've referred to um, here, too, um, and, in, and now as CPEC. Within China's global scheme, CPEC has emerged as the pioneer and a trailblazer. And I quote Keith. Therefore, I was very excited that on the initiative of my long-standing friend and colleague, Honorable Al Khalidun, Mr. Shari CEE, and on the kind invitation of the Pakistan government, I made my first ever visit to Pakistan from the 25th of October to the 1st of November in 2017 to study CPEC. Thanks to the meticulous arrangements of the Pakistan side, we were able to, in one week, visit. And the, the, the list is long, but just to summarize, um, the destinations were Islamabad, well, Pindi, Karachi, Quetta, and Gwadar. Um, Keith met officials, ministers from the government, um, civil servants on, on um, a state level and local level, um, development specialists, uh, provincial and city, and high-ranking military individuals, politicians from all parties, which I think is very important, um, and um, figured, figured heads from companies, um, private and otherwise, and media or, or, or organization people. Um, this included a number of interviews um, in, in media when he was there. Um, he continues, and I quote, we were able to visit and see firsthand key CPEC projects, including the port of Gwadar, as I mentioned, and the Kirat hydropower project north of Islamabad. <coughs> After, he goes on to say, after this intensive and exciting week, these were some of my basic conclusions. CPEC is a game changer. It is a pioneering initiative of unprecedented scope and scale. It has the capacity and the <coughs> potential to transport pa Pakistan, turning it into a developed nation, a regional hub, and a significant player in the global economy. CPEC also holds major significance for China, not merely, for example, in terms of energy security, but also as a showcase to the world for the globally transformative nature of the Belt and Road Initiative. CPAC also has major implications for other regional countries, um, and even for those neighboring countries that at the present time are unfortunately adopting a negative or skeptical attitude towards it. Supporting support for CPAC represents the considered view and national consensus of the Pakistani people and society. If the political situation is at times complex and changeable, this has no negative implication for the determination to pursue the CPAC project. The early harvest projects, and quote, 
security harvest projects, including the Port of Guadar, are well underway and even running significantly, significantly, significantly ahead of schedule. CPEC is a national project and, and will benefit all sections of society, Keith continues, all areas of the country and every community. This is clearly a long-term view. Due to the location of key projects, particular, particular benefits will accrue to hitherto undeveloped and marginalized areas, including Baluchistan, KBK, and the Jiljit Balistan area. Corporate social responsibility is intrinsic to Quebec with education, health care, vocational training, and so on built into major project plans. CPEC has already generated <coughs> significant employment opportunities for local workers who predominate in all projects. Moreover, skills, training, and technology transfer are provided by the Chinese side. While all this will benefit people from all Pakistan's communities and national groups, we were able to see in both Quetta and Wadar that jobs, training, and scholarships are going to a lot people. This is a project <coughs> of power not to exploit the Baloch. Despite contained regional instability and hostile pressures, the security situation in Pakistan is vastly improved compared to the widely reported state of affairs a few years ago. And this is something I've been involved in, in in research and so forth, and which is absolutely true. It's not a perfect situation by far, but it is it's definitely improved. The very highest importance is attached to the security of the CPEC projects and the workers. With a population of over 207 million, Pakistan is the world's fifth or sixth most populous nation country has a young population, some two-thirds of the total, ensuring an abundant labor supply for the foreseeable future. Women play <coughs> a strong role in society. At, this is every level. Okay. Um, not, I think it's increasing levels, but every level. Constitutionally, a minimum one-third of parliamentary seats are reserved for them. And nearly to close, it is demonstrating to the people that the Belt and Road Initiative is not just in speeches, not just on papers, but it is reality. It is bringing really positive changes to the lives of millions of people in Pakistan. This is a quote that he inserts from the Pakistan Interior Minister, Ashan Iqbal. And it goes on to state, it has helped significantly in overcoming energy shortages by investment in energy projects. It is helping connect different markets in Pakistan through infrastructure projects. And um, the Interior Minister continues to say, and we also hope that through its infrastructure, it will be a bridge between China Southeast Asia and Central Asia. Um, in summary, therefore, the CPEC is a 62 in this. I've seen so many in my own research various figures, but this is what Keith says 62 billion dollar project linking China's Xinjiang to the Chinese built port, built port of um, Gwadar in Baluchistan. Guadal received its first major shipment of Chinese goods in 2016. In December, Pakistan officials predict that the project will result in upwards of 700,000 direct jobs, and so on and so forth about um, statistics about how it's going to benefit the region, which, which have been well researched, I think, and um, are, are statistically, I think, will be proven to be pretty much correct. Um, Keith finishes more or less, saying, in all this, there are major opportunities for third countries and their businesses, including Europe and the UK. Early stage infrastructure may be 
mainly built by the Chinese and local companies, but many of the professional services, including banking, accountancy, and legal, as well as architecture and design, are already or will soon be provided by such major U UK companies, HSBC, and so on, era, blah, blah. Um, once the basics are in place, there will be opportunities in such diverse areas as hotels, services, textiles, and light industry, high-end manufacturer, consumer goods, and so on. Businesses from the Pakistan diaspora, be it in the UK, the Gulf countries, or elsewhere, are ideally placed to be the pioneers and icebreakers and bridge builders with their connections and familiarity with both societies and cultures east and west. And as Keith says, and I'm going to add a quick comment, Keith's final comment, is I hope we can continue this dialogue in order to make our contribution to the unique initiative that it set to positively transform the lives of Pakistan people and bring peace to the world. And I say here, here, thank you, Keith, for, for that. And I would only add that I was on um, a, a trade delegation with um, two colleagues from Third World Solidarity to China and to Hunan province in 2005. And we were, we were not <coughs> per se representatives of the future CPAC, but we were doing some groundbreaking work, I believe, in visiting universities, um, pharmaceutical plants, Rolls Royce, and et cetera, et cetera, places that were actually forging um, connections, economic connections with the West. That was highly enlightening to me. And as I've already mentioned, I've traveled extensive times to Pakistan. Um, I'm getting to know it a bit better, and I hope to continue um, that endeavor. Um, CPAC, I think, is phenomenal. There are problems with Gwadar. There are problems with some insurgencies. There are problems with the um, Baluchistan nationalists. But huge, monumental steps have been, are being taken by the government and the nationalists. I have to say, and others, to actually bring peace to Baluchistan, for instance. <coughs> and we already have a track record for the economy, even the IMF comments on this in Pakistan. And what's happening? So can I invite Cindy Berman to come and actually assist with the Pakistan? Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm delighted to share this panel and talk about the opportunities for Pakistan in relation to its exports and trade, largely also focusing on responsible business investment. Um, Pakistan has really an incredible opportunity in terms of its export industry. It is well known for its cotton, for its apparel and textile industry, for its surgical instruments um, and a number of other sporting goods and so on. And is well known for having really a competitive edge in that area. But there are also increasing uh, expectations um, by international companies by governments for more responsible business practices and for ensuring that respect for workers' rights is at the heart of that process. We know that responsible business investment and practices is also extremely com commercially competitive because when brands, retailers, uh, investors engage in, in Pakistan in a number of areas, they are hoping and expecting that labor standards and human rights will be respected. Um, the Ethical Trading Initiative is, in, is an alliance of businesses, trade unions, and NGOs that 
work collaboratively to tackle what we know are complex questions of, um, of labor standards in global supply chains. We've heard a lot today about the role and importance of the private sector in generating wealth and creating jobs. Um, but they need to be equal jobs because that ultimately creates greater wealth for the country. We know that Pakistan has had a um, preferential trade agreement with the European Union, and that has yielded a number of real strong advantages to Pakistan's ability to trade, and we know that the UK is committed to retaining that, that framework, um, even post-Brexit. Um, and ETI as an institution has uh, stands ready to work with industry bodies. I was there a few months ago and will go there again next month. We have a partnership with the Pakistan Institute for um, Labor Research and Education, PILA, um, to work with businesses, with trade unions, with, with NGOs, and industry bodies to make them aware of the opportunities that responsible business can bring and to conduct training and opportunity for multi-stakeholder engagement. We do believe that CPEC offers those opportunities. China has certainly signed uh, an, an MOU with the OECD the National Textile and Apparel um, Council has signed an agreement around responsible business. And we are really ready to, to support these efforts. Um, and thank you, uh, Excellencies, for, for inviting us. We, 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 my colleague Ben is here. We have a, a small leaflet saying what we're doing this <coughs> month. We're going to be conducting training and holding meetings with the Employers uh, Federation. We've met with the, with the Pakistan Business Council. We're meeting with the Lahore Chamber of Commerce, as we have done previously, and we'll be conducting training, as well as the Karachi meetings in Islamabad. There is really impressive amount of interest in engaging with us on this agenda. Thanks very much. Yes, indeed, we will be coming to you to help us. So can I invite Senator Javed Javad to speak? Thank you, Mustafa. It's a privilege to be here with this very esteemed uh, panel of speakers and to see amongst yourselves also uh, people who are interested in this subject. That is not just bilateral. On the face of it, China-Pakistan economic corridor sounds like a very narrow, uh, in relative terms, a narrow bilateral issue. <coughs> but it is part of a larger project, as you know, the One Belt, One Road Initiative, which has global ramifications. I don't want to exaggerate that importance, but anything that a country of China's size undertakes is bound to have global repercussions. Even though the physicality of the is concerned in six corridors that do not touch America or do not directly touch Africa, there will be repercussions and ramifications, whether it is for trade or for geostrategic purposes. So I will look at partly the internal dimensions and also the external. From purely internal point of view of Pakistan and China, it's a remarkable relationship. I look at it as the ideal odd couple. The ideal odd couple because we are so fundamentally different as two countries. I've counted at least 10 indicators which make Pakistan and China almost diametrically opposite each other. First, in terms of origins, uh, one, the historic nation state, the other, a nation state created just 70 years ago a name invented 77 years ago. And the other size, territory, population, 
political structure, uh, one uh, one party authoritarian political communism state wisely retained the stability of the communist party but changed economic communism. Pakistan is a boisterous, multi-party, vibrant state, chaotic often, but the opposite of China in terms of lack of uniformity, lack of uni unanimity. In almost every issue, there is a multiplicity of opinions between government and opposition and within the opposition. In ethnicity as well, China is largely Han Chinese, of course, predominantly Chinese. Uh, Pakistan is an ethnically very, very diverse state. So for these two countries to develop this extraordinary friendship, especially considering the fact that the first 10 years were also spent in a time of estrangement. There was Pakistan becoming the first Muslim country to recognize China, which should have facilitated the process. But as early as 1954, Pakistan joined uh, Seattle, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, which was considered to be China-specific. Uh, and then in 1955, we joined CENTO, the Central Treaty Organization, which was also <coughs> communist specific. In 1959, there was border tension between China and Pakistan. President Ayub Khan made a public statement saying that we shall respond forcefully if there are any threats from China. And then at the same time, parallel to us was our friendly neighbor, India, and that was the time when everyone was saying, Hindi, Chidi, Bhai Bhai, China and India are brothers. So the complete opposite of what exists today. The pivotal point was 1962, uh, when the China-India border conflict erupted. But it was notable that two weeks before that border conflict, China agreed to demarcate the frontier with Pakistan and very graciously surrendered about 2,000 square kilometers, which India, of course, uh, fiercely resisted. But China insisted that that territory belongs to Pakistan. And that border agreement then signified a complete shift of the relationship, precipitated by the Indo-China conflict of 1969. And thereafter, when Pakistan became the first non-communist country to open an air link with China, breaking China's isolation on the global level. And then as we continued, 1971, we played a catalytic role, which transformed the Chinese, Chinese relationship with the United States of America by President Yahya Khan acting as a conduit between Kissinger and Nixon. Thereafter, it's been a remarkable relationship solid, strong, and yet calibrated. It is a nuanced relationship. It's not something that Pakistan can always take for granted. But we can take for granted China's consistency despite the lack of major economic investment to date. Uh, the economic investment has not matched the political and the military commitment that China has given to Pakistan especially after 1971. Whether it is in the nuclear field, whether it is in the development of the combat aircraft called J-17, whether it's in the development of a large number of military uh, missiles and so on, China has been a source of valuable support. So this relationship is very complex. Pakistan respects that relationship. It also respects that China is not Pakistan specific. It has to look at India. And it has developed very good trade relations with India, and Pakistan does not resent that, uh, even though India does not think so. We look at the CPEC project as a tremendous challenge both for us internally, in terms of governance, the state, the uh, various corporations, the provinces, the private sector will have to conduct major internal reform. There are about 42 projects. There are a lot of misgivings and misconceptions. So let me take this opportunity to add to the confusion. But let me say that 70% of those projects, out of those 55, 60 billion dollars, is straightforward foreign 
direct investment. Any country is free to come and invest in Pakistan. And that's what they're doing. 70% of the 55 to 60 billion dollars is going to go into 21 energy projects on a basis of 17 dollars, uh, 17 percent return on equity in US dollars. So it's a straightforward FDI process. The rest of the 30 percent is loans, but loans on very soft terms, 2 percent. 2% markup on very generous time frames spread over 15 to 20 years. So is it a game changer? When you look at the total investment that takes place in Pakistan, it, this kind of investment of about two, three to maximum four billion dollars per year over 15 years is not more than 6%, not more than 6% of the total investment that takes place in Pakistan each year. So I would hesitate to call it a game changer. It is a new game. It gives extremely positive signals to a large number of investors around the world that Pakistan is a very attractive place to invest your money. Because remember that 70%, there are lots of entities putting in money with the confidence that they will get 17% return on equity. So uh, the, uh, the dimensions that uh, represent a challenge for Pakistan and for China is on the external front. Whether Pakistan's exports will grow at a rate at which we will be able to repatriate or remit the loans has been worked out. The International Monetary Fund has not sounded any alarm they released a report in 2017, and they feel that Pakistan has the capacity to remit what is going to be owed to China in terms of return of loan, in terms of outflow on profits earned by that investment of 70%. But the geostrategic and the geopolitical dimensions offer another picture. With the current irrationality that marks the conduct of US foreign policy, when Twitter becomes the medium for the expression of uh, thoughts, concepts, and principles that should require careful deliberation, we have entered a new phase of global uncertainty. And fortunately, Pakistan is partnered with a country like China, which takes its steps with great deliberation, and maturity, and reflection. And therefore, China represents an anchor for Pakistan in a world of tremendous uncertainty. When China wants to make Pakistan a scapegoat for its colossal failures of policy in Afghanistan. So on the Afghanistan issue, uh, how CPEC plays out is evidenced by the fact that both China and Pakistan have invited Afghanistan to become part of the CPEC process. It's not shutting out anyone. We even invited the Americans. A few months ago, I visited one of the CPEC projects in the large Karparkar arid region where these coal fields are being open pit mining is being conducted for an electricity project. And instead of ordering turbines from China, uh, General Electric from the United States was chosen by this joint venture between China and Pakistan to ensure optimal quality. So the vision of CPEC and the vision of China-Pakistan partnership is not a closed, uh, bilateral, uh, insulated kind of vision. It's a global vision. And I hope that in the years ahead and the times ahead, we will be able to reassure those to the east of us, or those to the west of us, that this does not in any way represent a threat. There are bound to be apprehensions about what kind of military potential Gavadar offers. China has already denied the rumor that Gavadar is going to be converted into a naval base for China. China has been given a $5 billion arms purchase <coughs> agreement by Pakistan, the single largest uh, contract that China has gained because we've ordered eight submarines from China. But this is only a minimal 
response by Pakistan to the extraordinary uh, fact that next door we have the world's largest importer of weapons. 70% of our neighbors' troops are deployed in a Pakistan-specific direction. So we have no choice. But so far, the extraordinary deft management of the relationship by China with India, trade at 80 billion dollars, uh, and extremely good relations with Pakistan, is an indicator of the maturity that will hopefully mark in the years ahead. And I look forward to the times when this uh, kind of project will help reform many aspects of Pakistan's internal institutions and governance conditions, and will represent, hopefully, a new era of greater stability regionally and globally. Thank you very much. So let me thank the media people here. Uh, let me thank the media people who are here. Tio Asif Darsa was sitting in ARY Channel 44, and also my members of Third World Solidarity. And I know there is a Chinese newspaper representative, and you are from? APB. Uh, APB. Moin uh, Saab uh, is sitting here. So there are a lot of people who are, and Rita Payne and David Page are sitting here who are actually forming a freedom strategy for Commonwealth countries, and I hope they have some success in our working with them. So there, can I invite His Excellency Sayyid Ibn Abbas to come and say to you. Extended tenure. <laughs> Could I begin by thanking you, uh, Alderman Dalkari, and the Third World Solidarity for hosting this uh, meeting. We are really grateful, and I think that the panel has been very, uh, very well informed and has given us a lot of uh, information, which is uh, most of the time lacking because, in word of one of the speakers here, you know, there's a perception and a reality. And I, I, I agree. The perception has been our greatest uh, sort of challenge. So I think the reality is different. But the perception, as I said, you know, in one day if you have three negative news, you probably get that it's not very really helpful. But the reality is that we are a big country of 270 <coughs> people. So things go on, and we are a very noble country like any other country of the world. Of course. We have our goals and highs, but thanks to the So, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's since a uh, lot has been said about the China Pakistan Economic Corridor, I do not want to repeat, but I would say just to and uh, reiterate you know, the importance. Uh, one of the speakers, Senator Jab uh, Javed Jabbar, said that China and Pakistan are dynamically in many ways. And I think he said in 10 different ways we are. Of course, that may be a, a reality to a great extent, but the fact is that there is a national consensus in the country, in Pakistan and in China also, about one thing, and that is the bond of, the strong bonds of friendship between our two countries. So I think that's the good news. Despite all the differences which we may have, culturally or socially or otherwise, but the good thing is that there is a general consensus that we are good friends and partners. So ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan, a nation of 207 million people, sitting in the middle of, I would say, literally half the population of the world. We are in a region which straddles across, we are a country which straddles across two regions, critical regions of uh, in South Asia, where we belong, Southwest Asia, in Central Asia. And we are sitting in the middle of 3 million or plus population. So I think that might be the certain implication we have. And uh, that, I think, says it all. Despite the critical locality of the strategic location we have, uh, we still need to get the word out that yes, we are open for business. Historically, as I said at the beginning, that Pakistan and China have enjoyed 
excellent political relations, but it is only three years ago that we were able to translate that strong political relation into an economic reality. And that reality is that China and Pakistan have signed this China and Pakistan economic corridor, which has a portfolio of $62 billion. So I think that this $62 billion, a lot is happening, uh, although Senator Jabbar says that you know he doesn't think it's a game changer, but I think <coughs> this is a transformative uh, phase which is taking place in the country. A lot is happening, and uh, we will be responsible to connect the landlocked western part of China to the Indian Ocean or to the Arabian Sea. So Gwadar is a deep sea port, which is right on the face of, or in the mouth of the Strait of Hormuz, which is critical, as you all know, I'm sure I don't have to tell you all the importance of these things, but this is what we are sort of uh, trying to sell, or to tell the world, that it is for <coughs> nothing else. There are no hidden agendas but to develop the region, to develop the area economically. <coughs> well, we keep hearing you know, that this is another sort of uh, occupation by the Chinese, or there's another uh, sort of uh, uh, economic colonization, etc., etc. But I think the reality is that uh, the history shows the Chinese have never had these kind of designs anywhere less uh, in Pakistan, which it is, they have enjoyed excellent relations. So ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan and China are determined to bring about that change because that change is very important. As it was said, that the CPAC is one of the six corridors, but CPAC amongst the six has the distinction of being the flagship project of the Belt and Road Initiative. So I think this is not only important for China, but it's also important from our, our point of view. And we expect a lot to be happening because China, uh, uh, the, because this, uh, in the last, uh, uh, I think in the next couple of years, we will be having the initial projects ready to go. And that is, I think, that's what will change the perception because seeing is believing. So once the, those projects are there, once the projects have started taken off, which they have, I think there will be a lot of uh, uh, change in the perception which we are facing at the moment. So I think if I have to say that all those projects by you know, would be you know, about 3,000 kilometers of network of roads, railways, optic fiber, pipelines, <coughs> transport of goods and services, communication from Gowada, in Pakistan to the northwestern region of China. So these, uh, I think, uh, transformative initiatives are not only going to be uh, game changer from our point of view, but I think we we consider them, you know, that they will be the highway to prosperity. Now, when we are both hosting the seminar here in the UK Parliament, what is the purpose? The purpose is that we want to get the word out, and that is that post-Brexit, there are opportunities. And these opportunities are for the British entrepreneurs. And the good news from our point of view is that when President Xi was here in October 2015, UK and China also signed $60 billion worth of trade agreements. So I think this is a win-win situation from our point of view. The two of our very good friends, with whom we have an historic relations, UK, of course, and China, are coming close to each other. So if I'm not, uh, you know, if my memory is not uh, faltering me, early this year there was a train, a goods train, which came from China all the way to London. So crossing through uh, nine countries and thousands and thousands of miles. So I think this is. Uh, silent revolution which is taking place, probably the world does not realize. So, but I think we are here to sell you know, our uh, 
point of view, and that is we are open for business. There are a lot of opportunities for the British entrepreneurs, and I think uh, the visits which have taken place by the Lord Mayor of uh, the City of London and by the Mayor Sajjan <coughs> and others, they will bear me out. And uh, why this uh, we want, why we think you know we are uh, uh, we are a country to be looked at afresh, as uh, Mark said, you know there is something going on. So I will say very briefly, we are a big country, large population, growing middle class, growing middle class, and on top of it. I can quote and if I have to say, I'll say, as per the PWC projections, by 2030, Pakistan will be one of the 20 top economies of the world. So ladies and gentlemen, there's something going on, needs to be looked at it, and I think uh, for that I would uh, urge the people who are looking for opportunities to make the best use of the UK, EF, United Kingdom, export finance uh, fund which the government of UK offers they have recently doubled to 400 million. Make the use of it if you have to. And take the advantage of being the first mover in the region if you want to, because there's this special economic zone coming up around the route of the CPAC from China to Guadar. I think there are a lot of opportunities for all those people who are looking for these um, investments in that region post Brexit. So with this, I would say once again, thank you very much to Mr. Lashari, to all the panelists here, and for you all uh, who have come this, uh, uh, to listen to this um, uh, talk of all of us, that you know, there is a something which is taking place. You need to watch it and look at it. Thank you very much. Let me invite. Uh, My name is Jeff, Jeff Chow, and uh, I'm head of Asia Pacific at the London and Partners. So that's now of London's Economic Development and uh, International Promotional Agency. At the Chem Mashin, this so last December, I pay a visit to uh, Pakistan uh, following our mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. So what amazed me is every single meeting uh, with our Pakistani host when we were in Pakistan, no meeting finished without the mentioning of our CPAC by our host in Pakistan. So you could see this CPAC had a huge uh, implications for not just Pakistan, not just China, but also for the businesses here. So I fully agree with uh, what the Senator Javid Jabbar said, so this is not a bilateral thing. So CPAC apparently that's a flagship a project of this Belt and Road Initiative, and in my eyes, Belt and Road Initiative is not a Chinese initiative, it's an initiative championed by China. So I agree with uh, Sir Mark said that maybe if you just treat it as a Chinese project, a Chinese program, or Chinese initiative, there will be some geopolitical elements associated with that. And we are having allies everywhere, and uh, we will have to take into account what they are concerned about. So uh, let me quote what uh, uh, one of the speaker after said. I think what matters the most for businesses here in the UK, in, in London in particular, is what we can benefit from that, what we can benefit from CPAC, and what we can benefit from the Belt and Road Initiative. So after I said, Commonwealth platform provides UK business access to opportunity offered by CPAC. I fully agree with that. I perhaps more than 100% agree with that. Thank <laughs> you. So what that really means, so because we have a contribution from uh, McKinsey, so I'm part of this uh, UK uh, Road, uh, working group. So we worked out the economic value of this uh, full participation of the UK into Belt and Road Initiative would mean 1.8 billion pounds every year going forward. <coughs> so that's a huge business opportunity. And how we play that? Commonwealth, so currently that's one of the platform. And within these 65 uh, Belt and Road uh, countries, there are 10, that's the double digits, there are 10 countries are Commonwealth countries. 
And within those <coughs> markets, you would be able to imagine so the huge share of the British export of the services and also the British goods there. And this is where we should be working with countries like Pakistan, with countries like China. So this uh, one plus one, or perhaps this a third country opportunity by working with China, and uh, Pakistan has already set a very good example how we benefit from this Belt and Road Initiative is really something we should explore a lot more. But having said that, this is exactly another thing we've been working towards. So this is another map showing the habitat documentation. You will see this Belt and Road finish in your roadmap. But His Excellency just mentioned uh, the water train coming to London finished in park. So we need to put UK, London in particular, so firmly on the map of BRI. So London and the UK is the natural western end of this belt and road. And we are a natural western partner to China on that as well. And for this 1.8 billion pounds, we should all working together And this CPAC set a very, very good example for us how to do that. So uh, before uh, I finish my uh, conversation, I just want to do a little bit commercial. So uh, my colleague from CBDC, please, uh, Lisa is also here. So if anyone closely following what has been agreed between China and the UK during the EFD, Uh, economic and financial dialogue last uh, December, there were 72 policy outcomes announced by the two governments. And in the 72nd item, it says this year there will be a Belt and Road Summit in London, organized by CBDC, London and Partner, CD UK, and uh, City of London. So this will be a faster opportunity and a good platform as well for us to showcase the UK expertise, how we can get the most out of this power and the world initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. I'm very kind of you coming and to this mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I know uh, our team could conclude it now. It is up to you. Should I conclude it? Any yeah, questions? Yeah. Thank you very much. That's what I was asking. Uh, that's what I was asking. No, no, no. There is no question. I'm concluding. Thank you very much because I know there's a lot of networking. Uh, let, me, let, me say, just, let me say two, three words. Let me tell you, Pakistan is the most resilient nation. I have been living here in Britain. I'm a British Pakistani. I was told in Manchester when uh, uh, So he read chaired the meeting that 80 countries have already signed up. 130 other countries are interested in it. So let's work together to make the British government and the European government to work with Pakistan and Belt Road Initiative to change and make this world more peaceful, more prosperous, and more tolerant and democratic country uh, world. Thank you very much for coming today. But can I ask you? a big hand to my old speakers who are sitting 